Before we dig into how to create a website using Python and Flask, we want to quickly explain you the concepts behind the World Wide Web and the Internet. The first concept we want to explore is the client-server architecture. When we talk about the World Wide Web, we can identify two types of actors, clients and servers. Our Flask application will act as one of these servers. It will receive requests from clients and responds with the proper data. There is a wide variety of clients. The most common one is, of course, a simple web browser, but there are many more. For example, if you're building a REST API using Flask, we can have a mobile app as a client making requests to our application, or a smart TV, or even a car. The web was built on top of the HTTP protocol. It's one of the most important concepts you should learn if you want to do the web development. It's the foundation of the internet. HTTP is a stateless, text-based protocol used to communicate clients and servers. That means that you will be able to see and read the information being transferred between them. To explore HTTP in, in detail, let's suppose you're browsing our Intro to Python course in our website remoter.com. The client initiates the requests, uh, and that's basically initializing the communication, by sending a request to the server. The request has the following form. From this request, you can see we're specifying the path that we want to access in the given website, in this case, remote.com, and then the protocol version that we're using. In this case, we're using HTTP 1.1, and this is a standard, so don't worry much about it. The most important part of the request is, one, is the one where you see the get part. This is the HTTP method used by this request. The client can specify different methods, get, post, put, patch, delete, head options. Each one of these methods will have a different meaning from the server. For example, you can get a specified tweet and by that you're just reading that tweet or you can basically post a new tweet and that means that you're trying to create a new tweet. In the final case, you can, for example, delete a given tweet by specifying that HTTP method. We saw that the server answers the client's request with an HTTP response. A typical response will look similar to this one. As you can see, the protocol version is included once again, and as we told you before, you don't have to worry much about it. You also see the body of the response that contains the actual content of the sites we're browsing. Finally, we see the status code being returned. This is the most important part of the server response. In this case, it's 200 OK. The status code informs the client the result of a request previously made. There are several status codes dividing the following categories. Usually, by reading the first character, you will identify the type of response that you are getting. If you are dealing with a 200 status code, you will, it will indicate that it's a successful status code. Let's see an example. Suppose that we are trying to use a URL shortener like bit.ly. In this case, what is going to happen is that we will try to access bit.ly to get the particular path that we are trying to get. Bit.ly is actually shortening a URL that actually belongs to our server. So what's going to happen is that our web browser will send an initial request to bit.ly and the bit.ly will respond with a 301 status code. In this case, it will inform the actual location of the website that we want to reach. Then our browser will just use that information in the location header to redirect to the correct place that you were supposed to go. Other example could be a bad request. You're trying to post a tweet you're, and you're forgetting some type of data or in other case, you could just send a tweet with more than 140 characters that will answer a 400 back from the server. You can see a comprehensive list of HTTP response status codes on Wikipedia and we encourage you to take a look at all of them. Finally, let's talk about HTTP headers. HTTP headers will allow clients and servers to include additional information. When you were seeing requests and responses, you saw that the client had the ability to send the request method or verb, get post, for example, uh, to include the type of request that they were trying to do. You also saw that the responses being returned by the server included a status code. 
but that's not even enough information to communicate in today's web. So uh, requests and responses can both include HTTP headers to augment the type of information that they are sending. For example, a request can, aside from informing the type of the request, in this case get the path and the protocol version, as we saw that was a traditional request, it can also include additional information in the form of headers. In this case, the host that is trying to reach the user agent, that's basically the type of client, and then, for example, the accept content type that it's accepting that request. It's basically informing the server that it can accept just text.html content type. It's also informing this, the server with the accept encoding header that it accepts content that has been zipped in order to minimize the uh, size of the response. The response, for example, can include additional information like the server, the content type of the document that it's returning, and also the content length. It's basically the length invites that it's returning. Again, these are just headers. We, you can look them around. There are many headers, and you can also create custom headers if you want to include some type of additional information for your clients or your servers. At this point, we're just scratching the surface of HTTP and the concepts behind how the web works. We would recommend you to keep learning about HTTP as it's one of the most important concepts for any good web developer. Understanding HTTP in depth will give you the possibility to create better, faster and more secure web apps.